There's something else in this field that's uh, equally exciting, if not even more so, because of the amazing results it's had with some leukemia patients. And we're going to ask Dr. Metz from the University of Pennsylvania to talk a little bit about what that project was about and what we are doing at the University of Pennsylvania to bring it to our neuroendocrine patients as well. So Dr. Metz. Green is forward. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, thank you very much, Giovanna. Thank you very much, Sita Sana. The left coast is the best coast. It's great to be here. Um, although I'm from the east coast. Hopefully not for ever. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here. This is uh, one of the, the leading areas of uh, activity in terms of neuroendocrine tumors, which is one of my three big passions. I told somebody earlier, golf, scotch, and neuroendocrine tumors, in whichever order you want to put them. And I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Um, multidisciplinary care. I've heard it a few times already. That's really the, the, the linchpin. That's the way to look after these patients. You guys know what it's like. You end up in a system that's all very big. You don't know where you're going. You're not sure how to deal with it. But you really need to be sure you're in a place that has multidisciplinary care with all the disciplines represented. Because no two patients are the same. And everybody needs a very personalized approach. And what I'm really going to be talking to you about is the ultimate personalized approach to neuroendocrine tumors and a project that we are in the process of doing at the University of Pennsylvania, which is funded, as Ron mentioned, through the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, and we are grateful for their support. So I'll be talking about CAR T-cell therapy for neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, clearly, uh, as neuroendocrinologists, CAR T-cells are not really what we're used to, so I'm going to just go with a quick primer on some of the immunological uh, uh, features here so that you can all be on the same page. I'm going to talk very little about neuroendocrine tumors specifically because we haven't really gotten very far in our studies. Thanks to Car Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, actually, which made sure we went about this in the right way, which is starting at point A and not starting at point C, which is what other problems have happened with many other drug trials. So what are CAR T-cells? They are chimeric antigen receptor T-cells. What does that mean? A chimera is an organism that is composed of two or more genetically distinct tissues. So we're going to take the native tissue and we're going to insert something in there to make it different. So it's two types of tissues and then you will recognize the foreign component in order to mount an immune response. What is an antigen? An antigen is a substance that stimulates the production of antibodies. So you're going to make a chimera to produce an antigen on a receptor, which is a molecular structure on the surface of the interior or on the surface or the interior of a cell that will then bind your substance, your smart bomb that is ultimately going to kill only cancer cells and not normal cells. And to do that, we're using T cells. T cells are white blood cells, they are lymphocytes, that interact with foreign antigens and other cells, and that is called cell-mediated immunity. The immunologists talk about cell-mediated cell immunity and antibody-mediated immunity. T cells are cells that kill other cells or stimulate B cells. B cells are cells that make antibodies, which you'll hear a little bit more about. So what is the difference between these cells, T cells and B cells? T cells, as I've already mentioned, produce cell-mediated immunity. In other words, they will attack foreign cells that have antigens which tell the body that they're abnormal. I really loved that uh, cartoon that was showing the guy uh, all dressed up as a spy, but if you know how to look for them, you can find them. They also produce substances called lymphokines, which boost the immune response to, uh, to um, inactivate antigen-producing cells. And one of the important roles of a T cell is it actually switches on the B cell. It teaches the B cells what antibodies to make to go and attack uh, abnormal antigen production cells. Most importantly, T cells have a memory function. So if you have a T cell in your body that produces, uh, uh, that recognizes an antigen as foreign, you will have that memory if you're exposed to that ever again. So if you've gotten 
smallpox, which you don't, let's take smallpox out of the picture, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, if you had measles and you got exposed to the measles virus again, your body would say, hey, we've seen that foreign ab ab abnormal uh, intruder there, let's rev up our our uh, um, immune response to get rid of it so you don't get reinfected, so you develop immunity. And the memory is important because if you're talking about tumors, when you develop a recurrence, you should still have that memory and therefore you might get a treatment at one point, but it'll be effective for a much, much longer time. The B cells, as I've mentioned, produce what's called the humoral immune response. So that is making antibodies. Those are antibodies against foreign antigens, or unfortunately, in autoimmune diseases, you make an antibody against your own cells. So I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm in Los Angeles. We can't be in Los Angeles without talking about gluten, and celiac disease, right? Well, there's an example of an autoimmune response, okay? You get exposed to gluten. That's conceived by your body as being a foreign antigen. You make an antibody to gluten, but it cross-reacts with your own cells on your own bowel, so you get an autoimmunity, you lose your, cell, uh, your um, lining of your small bowel, and you develop diarrhea and complications. So if you avoid the antigen, your immune system goes to sleep, you don't expose it, your cells survive, and you don't get your diarrhea. Same sort of idea. They respond to the T cells. The T cell is the marker that says to the B cells, hey guys, this is a foreign cell now, act against it. And that is called antibody-mediated immunity. So there are two kinds of immunity we're talking about here, the memory function on the T cell and the antibodies that the B cells produce. We're talking in this project about CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor T cells that will recognize the tumor as being foreign. Okay. So with that, now let's talk about the rationale. Targeted cellular immunotherapy can overcome many of the limitations of conventional chemotherapy. I think of conventional chemotherapy as being like a nuclear bomb. You provide a therapy that kills everything in sight, any rapidly turning over cells. So as a consequence of chemotherapy, you're going to end up with losing the cells in your bowel. You're going to get diarrhea and ulceration. You're going to lose the cells in, in the bone marrow. So you get anemia, etc. But that in addition, it's going to be turning, hitting the rapidly turning over cancer cells. Not as helpful in slow-growing tumor cells in the neuroendocrine process because these are slower um, um, turning over cancers and therefore not as amenable to chemotherapy as you heard in the previous talk. Other forms of adoptive immunity are really have been a pea shooter approach, okay? And the issue has been that you might have the ability to develop an immune response but it can't overwhelm the cancer that is just too strong. It's like shooting a pea shooter against a big tumor. And the reason for that is, as was pointed out so nicely in the video that Ron showed, is that these cancer cells have a great ability to elude the immune response. So how do we get around that? We want to, be some, we want to make something that's a smart bomb, okay? So what is happening here is you're doing genetically modified autologous T cells with directed specificity against tumor antigens. Very big mouthful, but basically what it is, you're gonna take the patient's own T cells, you're gonna change them by making them into a chimera that will produce an antigen that will then be able to bind to cancer cells and switch them off specifically. And there are three tremendous advantages over there. Number one, it's an antibody therapy. It's an antibody binding to an antigen. So it's specific. It is a cellular therapy, so that if you can grow these cells and your body can produce cells, those cells can then divide if they're living in your body and you'll get an amplified response. So you get a big shot, but it doesn't go away. And the third thing is that it is, in essence, doing a vaccination. You're putting a foreign antigen into a human, you're developing the immune response to it, and therefore there will be this memory activity. In fact, one of the things we worried about with CAR T cells for solid tumors as opposed to CAR T cells for liquid tumors like leukemias is that you might have other parts of the body that will respond and therefore that memory activity might give you side effects. So nothing is perfect until you try these things in reality. But the, the beauty of that is you can design these vaccines that they automatically switch off and on and it's way beyond my ability as a, as a, a gastroenterologist uh, but I can tell you there will be ways to tweak this once you uh, optimize it. So it's really creating a smart bomb, and I think it's a, a wonderful approach. 
So this has been around a long time, and there was a lot of preclinical rationale to do this, but there were technical de develop, uh, difficulties that really have prevented an effective clinical translation until recently. First of all, there was no guarantee that these cells would survive and would be able to expand in the body. And more importantly, can you grow T cells out of the body and grow enough that when you put them in, enough will survive to develop that response? Now there are efficient T cell culture systems. The other thing is was to get efficient gene transfer systems and to get adequate targeting. And many people have tried for many years, and this is where Carl June was so successful at the University of Pennsylvania, by finding the right target and by learning the way to infect the cells with actually, which is a modified HIV virus uh, that will allow these um, cells to multiply and grow and produce the antigen. As I mentioned in the past, in vivo expansion was limited, and how long these cells would survive was not known, but it wasn't long. Now there are ways we know to produce ongoing killing that will continue, possibly after recurrence potentially occurs. So in the old days, there was really disappointing clinical activity. So let me tell you a little bit about this, show you what we've done, and then show you a video. Here's a, a, a lymphocyte, a B cell, and on this B cell, there are a variety of different receptors. Both B and T cells have these receptors. And you can target these receptors with a monoclonal antibody, and then other words, all the antibodies go to the same place. You can engineer them. You can engineer them on T cells to do this. And what you can then put in are T cells that are stable, T cells that are attached to radioisotopes, so that's a sort of a PRRT idea, to drugs or to other toxins that can then kill, kill cells. And what Carl decided to target was CD19 for whatever range. There are now other CAR T cell type products that are targeting other antigens being developed as well. And this is a cartoon of what happens. So you take your eight modified HIV virus and you infect the T cells that you've taken out of the person. Those T cells then produce new antigens that are on the surface, and that antigen will uh, recognize, uh, that antibody will recognize the antigen sitting on the lymphocyte or on the tumor cell and will kill that tumor cell. The overview is as follows. All right, so you, you start off and you take blood out of the patient, the white cells, so it's leukapheresis. You coat them on an antibody, attach them to antibody-coated beads. These are magnetic beads so that the antibody that you are working on will select out those uh, leukocytes. They will activate the immune response and you will then grow them up on petri dishes, expand them outside the patient's body, run them over a magnet and pull out your beads and then you're going to be left with all the T cells that you've now grown up that recognize CD19 and you're going to put them back into the body and they'll kill all the tumor cells. The step of chemotherapy is important because you need to ablate the, the local T cells and give space for your infusion to grow. And I'm not sure ultimately if that's going to have to hold for uh, solid malignancies, but that's sort of how it's done with the leukemias. So, so far, this is the data. These are the data at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we found a massive CTL19 expansion. In fact, these cells will expand a thousand times. So one transfused cell will kill a thousand tumor cells in time as they multiply and grow. They can eradicate very bulky tumors, many pounds worth of tumor. And the, I'm summarizing for you here just the responses in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and acute lymphocytic leukemia, where the overall response rate has been in ALL 90%, CLL 47%, many complete responses, a lot of partial responses. And that what they, the most interesting part about this is they now are four years out. They've shown that in some patients these cells remain functional and they're on guard up to four years later. So you give a therapy that is still working four years later, which is kind of amazing. Let's quickly switch to our video to show you how impactful this has actually been. And then I've got a couple of slides at the end just to show you uh, what we're planning in the neuroendocrine world. If we can show the video. Take one. Is it hard for you to say those words? We're trying to cure cancer. 
That's a, a really good question and why it's hard to say we want to cure cancer. We do. And uh, I think sometimes it's hard actually to think that you might actually succeed. Patients that we're treating on this clinical trial have absolutely no other options left for them. These are patients who are unfortunately uh, destined to die of their disease and in a fairly short amount of time. Emily Whitehead, 554. So Emma is uh, incredibly matter-of-fact about all of this stuff. This was a child who had had her leukemia come back twice. The parents were looking for a miracle. What we've learned how to do is train the immune system to recognize and then kill tumor cells. It's a procedure where we collect their T cells and they are infected with a virus that will genetically change them so that they will now see and react against their leukemia cells. And we actually use the HIV virus to do that. So you're taking the HIV virus and infecting healthy cells with it to help kill cancer? Yes. The virus has been engineered so that it can't cause disease anymore. But it still retains the ability to reprogram the immune system so that it will now uh, attack cancer cells. We call those modified immune cells serial killer cells. Each infused cell can kill more than a thousand different tumor cells. But the reality is the dramatic responses of cancer to new treatments are very unusual. We need to make it clear when we talk to a family that it may not work. Emma was given her T-cell treatment, and within a few days, she was very sick. She had breathing difficulties. She had blood pressure difficulties. We knew that she could not have gotten any sicker without actually dying. But then a remarkable thing happened. The T-cells were growing. They were starting to fight the cancer. Within hours, Emma's fever disappeared. It was like the calm after the storm. The clouds went away, and she woke up, and there was no leukemia. When that child survived, it was, of course, an amazing uh, uh, event. Thanks. Uh, if we can get back to the slides, thank you very much. That uh, video always gets me. So, as you can imagine, there are now many potential targets. So, the, 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 there's the liquid tumors, the leukemias, and lymphomas, and then there's moving over to all other solid tumors, of which neuroendocrine tumors are a great example to work with because they have established receptors that are relatively unique that you can then target. So the somatostatin receptor is something that you can harness with CAR T-cell technology. So what's the rationale for using CAR T-cells for neuroendocrine tumors? They have specific receptors, somatostatin type 2 receptors, that can be targeted for this kind of precision directed therapy, so-called theragnostic. So the same approach for therapy and diagnostics. Some people take the G out of theranostics. So an example is somatostatin receptors are utilized for diagnosis, the octria scan. For biotherapy, you just heard a nice discussion about the various approaches, octreotide, lanreotide, they bind to SS2 receptors. We haven't discussed much, but very prominent, and I'm a great supporter of, PRRT uh, therapy, peptide radioreceptor therapy, which will bind to the SST receptors with a poison that can kill cells. So can SST receptors, either type 2 specifically or others, be leveraged for CAR T-cell therapy, just like CD19 was used for the therapy of B-cell malignancies, CLL and ALL, as I showed you. 
Now, what would this require? This will require the same approach. Ex vivo, outside the body, expansion of autologous, your own T cells, so they're not seen as being foreign. They've been engineered to produce antibodies that will then target the SST receptor on the surface of malignant cells without affecting normal cells. So our uh, hypothesis for the grant that was funded by uh, Caring for Cosmoid Foundation is as follows. It is now possible, we believe, to develop and deliver a sufficient number of properly activated T cells that express an engineered anti-SSTR CAR protein to overcome tolerance and eradicate neuroendocrine tumors, including metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. The program has three, and we are hoping for four phases. Phase number one, to generate and optimize engineered CAR T cells to target neuroendocrine cells that express a high level of SSTs. We think SST2 is going to be the important one. We're not convinced it's going to be, and we're actually in the process of developing that portion of the grant right now as we speak. We need to do that as step one. You need to actually show that you can do it. Then you need to test it, as you saw with Ron's earlier slide, and to see if it actually works in cell models. So the next step is that you're going to take these T cells that you can grow, and you'll evaluate if they have specific anti-tumor activity in, uh, in vitro, in Petri dishes. Once you can show that it actually binds in, in Petri dishes, you want to move to vivo, do it in vivo, and you're going to then take these optimized cells, test them in various preclinical models, including mouse models ideally initially because that's something that's been established but hopefully we're going to want to try and do it in other models in the future and that is where this prize that was mentioned earlier that's going to grow a hundred thousand bucks anybody who can who can find a way to grow carcinoid tumors and get them to sustain so that you can have a trial where you have cells that are um, models that aren't treated and models that are treated and sort of have a randomized approach to so that your therapy actually works. And we believe that we can get through those three steps. The fourth step was our very exciting uh, step that we want to move to and which is what I'm waiting for as a clinician is once we're optimized is going to be able to move this into widely metastatic patients who have a, a distinct advantage in the neuroendocrine world in that they're healthy and physically able and despite having a lot of tumor bulk. So this is a perfect disease model for us to try, and I'm hoping that in a couple of years' time we'll be able to change the whole landscape. So with that, let me just give some acknowledgments. You saw photographs there. David Porter is the clinician at Penn. Uh, Shin Shin Hua, who, who wasn't actually shown, is my collaborator in the Bench Lab, who's well-funded as a neuroendocrine uh, expert and does a lot of multiple endocrine neoplasia work. Carl June, who's the giant that's made this all happen. It's all been done through the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania, funding through the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, and there is a collaboration with Novartis Oncology, who we've licensed some of the CAR-T technology to and who own the SST2 receptor construct. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope this has been interesting to you. Great job, Dr. Metz, great job. Now you can see why we're so excited about this. It's just unbelievable. So here we are, and by the way, this, this shows how the process works. We heard about Carl June from, I think, we, one of our earlier programs like this at, at UPenn. We said, you know, Novartis is funding all this work with this for major cancers, but not for the rare disease space of neuroendocrine. It's up to us to do that, and so, I've been with Carl June now, he's like a rock star in the cancer research world, you can't get next to this guy, but uh, he's so, as you can see, committed on a very, very personal level to this and takes this challenge seriously and uh, we're just thrilled. So we've raised enough money to do those first three phases, we are hopeful and we will commit to funding those clinical trials if we can get the kind of results that we hope for here. So thank you very much again, Dr. Metz.